Hey guys, so this week we're looking at the civil rights movement. We're still working on the Cold War, but the civil rights movement landed right within the Cold War era. So during the civil rights movement, there was something called Jim Crow laws. These laws were initiated directly after the Civil War during the Reconstruction era. So you should have learned a little bit about the Jim Crow laws when you learned about the Civil War during fourth grade. But if you don't remember, I'm gonna kind of remind you. Uh, the Jim Crow laws were basically laws that the South created to legally circumvent the Constitution. So basically what those laws did was that they said that Blacks had the right to have the same equality as whites, but in a separate platform. So it was a separate but equal was the way it was referred to. In this attitude, it meant that African Americans still got to go to school. They still were able to go to public uh, to pools. They were able to go drink water from water fountains and go to bathrooms and eat at restaurants. However, it was not in the same way that whites could. So if a black went to go to eat at a restaurant, they would have to go around the back to get food or they would have to sit, sit in a separate area. If they wanted to sit on a bus, they would have to go to the back of the bus to sit down. And if there were no seats, they'd have to stand. If they were on a bus and a white passenger got on the bus, they would have to give up their seat even if they were in the blacks only section to the white person. So it really wasn't fair. When you think of the education also, they didn't receive the same education. They didn't receive the same resources. They had teachers that probably or may not have had the same academic education um, for them to be able to truly, honestly get the same education as their white counterparts. In the 1960s, during the civil rights movement, this um, the civil rights movement was actually very integral in ending the Jim Crow laws. Uh, with the new legislations that came into effect, which when you're talking about legislation and, and that sector of our uh, government, that's the one that creates laws. So through the legislation and then um, the Supreme Court, they were able to pass laws that deemed separate but equal as unconstitutional. So when we're looking at some of the laws and the things that it impacted, one of them was voting rights. African-Americans did not have the right to vote as whites did. Well, when you don't have the right to vote, then you can't make changes in the government and the way that the government does things. So in order to keep it as a separate but equal and African-Americans continuing to be um, treated poorly, they made it so that they couldn't vote. If they can't vote, then they can't elect officials that were going to support the civil rights movement. Some ways that they prevented them from voting was by saying that they had to pay poll taxes, which a lot of the African-Americans couldn't afford to do at the time, or to take literary literacy tests that were impossible to pass. So some of those things really impacted, or most of them really impacted the African-American community. And that's where the civil rights comes in. The civil rights movement really supported um, the African-American community and helped them to be able to pass laws that would truly include them as equals in society. Um, one such case that came across during the civil rights movement was Brown versus the Board of Education. So Brown versus the Board of Education was a case that involved Linda Brown, where her father, uh, an African-American family, wanted her da his daughter to have a good education. So they sued the school board. And this was in Topeka, Kansas. They schooled the, the they sued the school board to make it so that his daughter would be able to attend school with whites and get the same education as the whites. Um, during this time, they also looked at cases like Plessy versus Ferguson. In this case, the court had ruled that separate but equal facilities were permitted. In arguments made by lawyers in the case of Brown versus the Board of Education, lawyers, including Thurgood Marshall, which you should have learned about back in third grade, they held such a division that was um, it was inherently unequal, that being able to separate blacks and whites was really not an equal way to treat them. So there was no equality and that children of color were not receiving the same educational opportunities as their white peers. As a result of this court case, the Supreme Court ruled that separate was not equal. In the court's final ruling, they had determined that segregation of students violated the 14th Amendment and therefore declared that it was unconstitutional and that schools needed to desegregate. The Supreme Court agreed that children of color were not receiving the same educational opportunities as their white peers. By 1954, the ruling resulted in the onset of dual, dual of school, sorry, desegregation. So basically they were now taking every district and forcing them to desegregate their schools and busing African-American children into the white schools. 
As a result of the Supreme Court ruling, there were lots of riots. There was a lot of fighting and picketing and uh, protesting because whites were not very happy. You may have heard the story of, of Ruby Bridges. If you haven't seen it, you probably might want to see if you can find it on Netflix um, or on Hulu. Uh, it's a great movie, and it's about a little girl who in kindergarten was also one of the only little girls in the school to go and be the one to integrate the school. So imagine being in kindergarten at five years old and being the only little black girl in a school and being treated badly, not just by the adults, but by the students and the teachers. It was a pretty sad time in our history. Um, after we had the Supreme Court hearing for Brown versus the Board of Education, uh, we started looking at public transportation. In many locations in the South, the Jim Crow laws forbade people of color from sitting in the front of buses and streetcars. So I mentioned that a little bit earlier. So there was a certain woman who actually, most of you know, it's Rosa Parks, and she um, is known as a civil rights activist today. And she's the one that basically pushed along the desegregation of public transportation. And Rosa Parks didn't go out on that morning um, that she refused to sit, stand up from the bus um, trying to make a political statement. She was just tired. She was an older woman and she had been working all day and she was tired and she did not want to get up. She was sitting in the back of the bus in the black only section. The bus was full of people and a white gentleman got on the bus and the bus driver asked her to move and she refused to do so. Um, as a result, she was arrested. Well, Martin Luther King, which all of you know about, he uh, sought out Rosa Parks and then had her become the face of what was now what we now know as the Montgomery bus boycott. So Martin Luther King was very much about peaceful protesting. He did not believe in violence. He did not believe in fighting. He did not believe in, in using cruel language to talk to people. He believed that if you really wanted to get something accomplished, you had to do it through peaceful means. So what he did was he joined people together and they uh, boycotted the public bus transportation. Well, if you think about it, <clears throat> most of the bus transportation made their money from African-Americans who rode the buses. So when all of the African-Americans in the South decided to stop riding buses, that impacted or hurt the economy for or, or the, the business side of the bus transportation. As a result, they were eventually forced to have to say, OK, fine, we're going to desegregate our buses because it was either desegregate your buses or you go out of business. Um, the bus boycott actually lasted a little over a year. And again, it was known as the Montgomery bus boycott. Now, I know you've heard of Dr. Martin Luther King. He was actually a pastor in a local church in Montgomery, Alabama. He became the leading activist behind the Montgomery bus boycott. He also led the, the Million Man March in Washington, D.C., fighting uh, where, where millions of people joined together to protest the inability to vote, equal equality in jobs, so equal pay for equal work, um, and so forth. He worked with John F. Kennedy um, to try to pass legislature. Unfortunately, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated before he could actually see all his hard work come to fruition. So he never got to see the world that he had wanted to create, the world where everybody would get along, where black boys and white girl and, and white boys could go to school together, um, where we were so um, integrated that it just worked and everybody treated each other with respect. Um, if you wonder where my, Dr. King got his ideas from, his ideas came from civil rights activist Mahanda Gandhi. So he was also a very peaceful Indian civil rights activist, and he his belief was that peaceful protest was the way to go. So stay tuned. I'm going to add a video um, on the bottom of our activities so that you can learn a little bit more about the civil rights movement. This is it where I'm going to stop for today. And then I will keep an, a lookout for the next video, okay? Y'all have a great time. Make sure to look at your PowerPoint. I included a PowerPoint that has videos that went with my PowerPoint that I would have used in school so that you can just watch the videos and listen to the recordings from different videos that I had found that integrate to what we're learning, okay? Have fun. Enjoy.